Behind me is the first 3D printed house in Florida. It was constructed by some familiar actors using a Cobot printer, Printed Farms, built the walls of this structure behind me. And the general contractor for the project was Precision Builders run by James Light. My name is Jared Gross and I've been traveling the world to every 3D printed house trying to bring the exciting promises of this future to the public eye so that we can look at the facts and the true cost benefits and challenges of the 3D printed construction industry. Right now, only the 3D printed portion of the project is completed with a little bit of electrical work that you can see coming out of the top. We'll look at that in a minute. It's a pretty interesting project. The layers are somewhat inconsistent and there are some things that we'll touch on as we walk around the house. There are chalk marks on the wall from a, a girls group that got to tour this house and see a glimpse into the future. And there's a lot of unique features that we haven't seen yet on other projects including some walls that were printed and then moved to their final resting location as opposed to the entire house being printed with the overhead gantry set up. These two walls here were printed and then moved into their final resting place. When they moved these two units, originally they had something in the window there to keep the top from collapsing. They were then able to remove that window lentil and be left with just the printed concrete and some mesh at the top there. They put these pipes in, most likely to be able to maneuver these walls. You don't see these in any of the other walls, and so it's safe to assume that was the purpose. Now, as we enter the building, you can see how they do the overhangs. They print, print, print all the walls, and then when they get up here, they build this structure out of just regular uh, two by fours and a two by 12 up there so that they can print on top of it and it will support the wet concrete as it hardens. Once the concrete cures, you can remove the wooden portions and just have the concrete spanning overhead. Now we're in the front entrance of the building. This is mostly a big open section and behind you is where most of the rooms are. It appears there's at least three bedrooms, uh, maybe an extra uh, lounge room or office space as well. The concrete is kind of inconsistent. I mean, they're not perfectly smooth layers, but they really never are perfectly smooth, especially for a product of this size. You can definitely see some of the more noticeable flaws, like the section here has been uh, pushed down by something. This may be because there was a poor layer connection between two layers, so by pushing it down, they're able to squeeze the layers together and make sure there's a solid connection between them. Uh, there really isn't so much cracking in these walls, which is really nice. Uh, I'm sure the humidity in Florida, it's extremely humid right now, that really helps with the curing process of the concrete. The higher the humidity, the healthier the curing process is because the, uh, the additional moisture. Another factor helping them avoid cracks is this expansion joint here. There's also a reinforced concrete column behind each expansion joint with rebar and poured concrete, just a standard RC column that will be the structural support for the roof. Most of the engineering calculations are done based off of these reinforced columns. It seems like this house will have pretty high ceilings, maybe nine feet tall. If you look closely up here, you can see the electrical. They also use this uh, PVC pipe to create a gap through the wall. That way they can put in either wiring, HVAC, plumbing, something along those lines uh, and have a gap through the wall that doesn't need to be cut out of the hard concrete. By making manipulations to the printed concrete while it's wet, it's much easier rather than having to bring in a saw. You can just use a spatula or your bare hands. Here's a closer look at what those expansion joints look like. They fold into themselves to allow a gap for room that the concrete can expand in case it becomes warmer or shrink if it's cooler. The outlets are here cut out from the concrete. I'm not sure if they plan on plastering over this or not. I plan on doing a podcast episode with the general contractor behind this building so we can get all these details from them. And then of course do an updated video when they do all the finishing and have it look like a home ready for move-in. They haven't yet insulated this house, but I was told they plan on using foam creep 
instead of typical spray foam insulation. There's the concrete base used to support one of the Z axes of the Kobod Bode 2 printer used to construct this building. Now we're in the master bedroom featuring its own large closet and also a door to the outside. Maybe they'll put some kind of porch out there. Here are the final two rooms. This one is a typical bedroom with a closet. This one is more of an office space, no closet, but it could be used as a bedroom in a pinch. It features the two walls that were printed uh, not in place and then brought to their final resting place. Uh, a unique feature of this project. If you look really closely, you can begin to notice some of the aesthetic flaws in the building. Up here, there's been some dripping where wet concrete for some reason was dripping from a top section down to lower sections. This could be because the material was too liquid. Um, it's pretty tricky with wet concrete to get it off, especially when you're printing wet concrete on top of wet concrete. While it's wet, if you were to try to push this stuff off, it would leave a noticeable mark on the, on the wall. Uh, some other visual defects, here you see it was flattened, smoothed out for some reason. Uh, same thing here, a little bit here as well. This can be because of, like I mentioned earlier, poor layer adhesion. Uh, squeezing it down can get you a better connection between subsequent layers. So that's the first 3D printed house in Florida, built by Precision Builders using uh, Printed Farms as the 3D printed concrete subcontractor on a, a Kobab Bode 2 printer like we've seen many other projects completed in the past both in Europe and America. It's obviously still a very much a work in progress. These projects are experimental not only for the companies completing them but also for the municipalities they're being built in. The town of Tallahassee is looking at this project thinking do they want more 3D printed houses in the future? Is it a potential solution to the affordable housing crisis? People like Precision Builders, Printed Farm, Kobod, they're looking to find these solutions and taking the risk both with their time and dollars up front to figure out how to make this technology work for you. If you've enjoyed this content, as always, make sure to like and subscribe so I can keep bringing you the latest, greatest 3D printed construction projects around the world. The second print was in some ways easier, some way harder learned a lot about the hardware and the programming the software but on the other hand the footprint was three times longer and we printed the inner walls as well so um, we increased speed and productivity i think it's up two and a half to to three times in the productivity we printed at max speed when we did the shed we were at three quarter of a foot per second this print we did uh, 14 inch per second max, um, max speed. So that was an improvement. And also, yeah, the footprint was almost double size. And we also did the, did the inner walls. Mm -hmm. So that makes it three times bigger. And what times of the day were you printing? So we, we were printing. We, we tried to get started um, in the morning, um, but everyone who is in 3D printing knows that it doesn't always go as you plan. And um, some days we were up printing at nine, some we were up 10 and so on. Um, we felt that we started off with a really good pace. We did the first three days, um, First day we did 17 inch, second day um, we had some inspections and so on on site and third day we did 20 inch. So it was, um, it was a good speed and we learned a lot. So for printing, how long does it take to print two feet at 14 inches per second uh, of the Tallahassee house? So how long were you printing each day? So we tried to be around layer time, around uh, 14 minutes, um, 14 to 15 minutes. Um, so it took different times. We had some issues with the um, host management um, system because of a neighbor, but um, so we have, have to change the changed the position of, of, of the hose quite a few times and it was time sure. consuming. Would three to six hours be a good estimate? 
Yes, that would be a good estimate. Three to six hours every day. So if you're starting around nine o'clock and finishing uh, at 12 p.m. to maybe 3 p.m. in Florida, especially towards 3 p.m., now you're getting towards the hottest part of the day. Uh, how did how did that work for you? I know other companies have avoided printing in the middle of the day, even companies further north than Florida in older climates. So, in your experience, what was that like? You got your project done, so I assume it wasn't too bad. No, I think the most important is that you really start curing the walls very fast, and you start watering them a lot and cover them up. That's um, Otherwise, when it comes to material consistency and so on, we didn't experience any problem um, printing in the sun in that way. Um, but I think focus on the curing was, uh, was important for us. Sure. And so now, are you more satisfied with the layer quality you achieved on this newer project? Yeah, we are, but we we are working on um, other type of engineering of the wall to make it um, uh, to make it both faster and um, and better. Um, because the way we're building now doesn't make use of the top performance of the machine itself. Uh, but we have to build it that way to build um, solid houses and get up the, the, the vertical columns. So, um, but we would put in more effort into the R&D and the engineering of, of the walls now. Was there more non-structural fracturing? What do you mean by that? Like micro hairline fractures in the wall? Yeah, some places you always have that, especially if you run a layer dry but um we always pad them up and and um, and make sure they are they are filled okay but the surface cracks are um are happening sometimes at 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 the last layers when you stop but but we become much better at at, at covering that up um by you know filling them up and by curing the material better do you intend on smoothing the wall out uh, like you did on the garage print? Yeah, so it's going to be um, it's going to be stucco and plastering. This time, when you brought the printer to the Tallahassee site, um, was setting it up. How does it compare to the first time you set it up? So um, we are gaining skill on setting it up, but we, um, this was probably the most hard place to put the, to put the printer up. Um, um, we had power lines going at 11 feet and we had a big tree in front of the whole property. So it made it very tricky, but by putting it up at this place, uh, we will definitely have a easier ride when we, when we, when we come to, uh, to other work sites. And you use an off-road forklift again? Yes. It takes um, everything between four and eight hours to assemble the machine. Sure. How long did it take you guys the first time? Because I know you didn't get a cobot trainer on site to help you with the initial training or the initial setup. Um, so how, I'm sure it took a little extra time your first time. Oh, sure. The first time, I think we did it in two or three days. Um, um, yeah, most likely two days. Um, and then it was up. It's not, it's not that complicated. And also, if you have someone experienced with, with, um, with, um, with measuring, um, so you can get the plinths right and the distances right. It is, it is, it is not that complicated. Obviously, it gets complicated the higher you get when you when you get more sections going up. Sure. So where is the printer headed next? So the printer is now in um, 
in uh, Loxahatchee, uh, or it's going to arrive this morning. Um, it's it was taken down yesterday. Um, we have three projects lined up now, where we already have have uh, have lots and and uh, working on the contracts with our partners. And I mean, after we have a constant stream of requests, I think we have received. 600 requests since um, since February for for building, so we can definitely not fulfill the fulfill the demand. Um, so that's that's also our next step um, to start scaling up. Are those three prints all in Loxahatchee? No, um, one is up north. Uh, one is in Lake Worth Beach. One is in Miami. All homes? In, um, yes, all homes. Very nice. And is your expectation to uh, build these at market price, potentially below market price, or uh, is it like a higher value project product that might be above market price? Yeah, I, I think we are we we are still in the upper range of a shell price, sure. but a shell price can vary a lot down here. It also depends what you're building. So if you're building low income house, it's very hard for 3D printing to compete right now at this moment. If you're looking at the luxury end where you have more curvature, uh, curvature, more um, advanced architecture, all of a sudden we can come in at a lower price. But I think a lot of things needs to happen or is going to happen the next one, two year. One is that the material price will go down when it comes up to scale. Um, two, the teams will be much more skilled. Three, we can integrate the architecture and the structural already at the design phase to make the um print much shorter which means we have less days um, less days on site and three the pipeline uh, for the 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 upgrades and the and the things cobalt is working on over in denmark is really amazing because they are focusing on 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 um, helping the people out here and take the feedback very well so we can have fast feedback loops and change change the things that 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 needs to be changed we also need to upgrade our 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 machine a bit but i think we should be now we printed nine days up in tallahassee i think easily with a couple of changes just a couple of tweaks we would have a five six um, um, printing days up there in tallahassee for the for the whole project so that means that you can basically come in with the machine in the morning, assemble it the same same day. If, if the site is prepared, you print for five, six day, you pack down and you're out of there and you know, you do the whole project in nine, 10 days. That's where we want to come in the first step. The next step is to be to be even faster. But it also depends on if you want to print the slab and and pour pour the slab and so on so but we are working with this whole system and and we see that every print every every project we do we become uh, better um, at everything yeah it's fascinating to be uh, kind of pushing towards this point of efficiency where you reach like a, a cost below traditional construction to it's close and you you especially being on the ground, seeing the progress from the first Cobalt Print of America now to the prints happening today, uh, the progress that it's made. And you can see, I guess, the trend line is pointing towards uh, something cost effective. I know you've been experimenting a ton with materials. Has that yielded any interesting results? Oh, we are, um, we are, we are testing different materials but so far you know Ladicrete has a fantastic material that is that is um, 
that is easy to um, easy to print with and that's the most important in you know real environment um, you don't have to be as accurate as you need with other materials on the water level it has a little bit better better leeway there mm -hmm. because the material consistency change a little bit out there so so um, because of the sun the sun goes in the cloud etc size of the hoses the size of the of the parts in the pump the rotor stator conveyor screw the water temperature everything affects so you need a material that it's robust so you don't have like half a percentage where you have to hit hit the water the water ratio um, you need a little bit bigger ratio there two three percent to be able to um, to do a good job did one rotor stator get you through the whole house print in Tallahassee? Um, no, we had to we had to change one time. We we accidentally got a got a stone into the silo that went um, through the whole system, mm -hmm. slice slice up the rotor stator a little bit, and it uh, got stuck in the hose. Um, so that's another thing we are working on to make sure that you know the silo is completely covered, that 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 the material coming in is uh, of good quality. We're also looking into other solutions to 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 feed the material. If it's with silo or other solutions, we will see. But it is um, um, yeah, it is a very important part. Uh, how to how to feed the sack especially what we saw now is when we did the first project we could see that we're feeding you know quite few sacks but once you get up to a fast to a bigger footprint and a faster print you need to feed pretty often and one issue with the material it's almost like flour so it's very it is very fine so when it comes down into the silo, it creates almost like a sinkhole. So you'll constantly need to move the material. But for our next um, next um, customer, we have uh, both vibrator and also a system with air that we are moving the materials. We should mitigate that problem. Very interesting. Um, so if the demand is strong, what's the biggest uh, bottleneck to printed farms growth or in to ask a different way what would be the best catalyst to expand printed farms into a bigger company fast um capital and that's um and that's what we're working on now and um i mean you need more machines on the ground um more teams on the ground um we have um collaborations coming up both with uh, universities for r d but also with colleges to start train the future workforce uh, of um, of 3d printers uh, so um yeah capital to be able to put into r d get more machines get more people involved um, and when you get more machines do you think you'll continue to procure cobot units or will you diversify your equipment? No, we will 100% go with um, with um, with cobot. They have the best machines and um, they're also, you know, ahead of the game from my knowledge when it comes to to uh, to R&D and pipeline. Um, I don't know what the other printer manufacturers are doing, but um, I know what Cobot is doing, so um, we go with them. Yeah, I get a chance to talk to a lot of these different companies and they all say they're the best, <laughs> yeah. not surprisingly. <laughs> but right. I would really be fat. One day we'll get a side-by-side -side and we'll truly see them next to each other printing the same model or similar models. Uh, I'm looking forward to when that day comes, but until then, uh, there's a lot of best printers in the world. If you um, if that is happening, I'm I am I am up for the challenge.
or printed forms is up for the challenge. You loan out, you lease your printer, drive it up to somewhere in Florida for a competition. <laughs> that would be exciting. See the performance. Yeah, but if it I is, find somebody uh, else, I'll let you know. Yeah, it's good. No, I think, you know, everyone, I have full respect for everyone working in construction 3D printing. Uh, I have respect for all the companies because what, what everyone is doing is very hard. And um, of course it is kind of a race, but the business is big enough for, for, um, for many players within this industry. And um, it's gonna take time and it's a lot of tweaking and it's a lot of uh, small factors here and there that has to be mitigated um, during print. But just to see our development since you know, September when we started started our first print until now, it's just, we understand everything much, much better. The Tallahassee was, was you know, it was a great experience for us. And, and we have been working there with um, precision building and renovating um, uh, James and Kindra Light, who has been interested in 3D printing for four years. And um, it was great that we could, you know, pull this off, they started a company also, Gulf Coast Additive Manufacturing Design. Yeah, how many square feet is it again? Almost uh, 1,600. If you guys just went 350 square feet more, you could have been the biggest house in America. It's coming. All right. It's coming. <laughs> Sounds good. Right. Well, yeah. I'll let you go because uh, we'll do a longer podcast episode. On yeah, let's another. do it. Occasion. Um, good catching up with you. I'm looking forward Sounds to meeting good. James Light. Yeah. And uh, yeah, afterwards we'll get in touch, maybe do a cost breakdown or something in the future. All right. Sounds good.